Day 5949. I wake up. Immediately I have to figure out who I am. It's not just a body. Opening my eyes and discovering whether the skin on my arms is light or dark, whether my hair is long or short, whether I'm fat or thin, boy or girl, scared or smooth. The body the body is the easiest thing to adjust to if you're used to waking up in a new one each morning. It's the life, the context of the body that can be hard to grasp. Every day I'm someone else. I'm myself. I know I'm myself, but I'm also someone else. It has always been like this. The information is there. I wake up, open my eyes, understand it is a new morning, a new place. The biography kicks in, a welcome gift from the not-me part of the mind. Today I'm Justin. Somehow I know this. My name is Justin. And at the same time, I know that I'm not really Justin. I'm only boring his life for a day. I look around and know that this is my room. I look around and know that this is his room. This is his ho home. The alarm will go off in seven minutes. I'm never the same person twice, but I've certainly been this type before. Clothes everywhere, far more video games than books, sleeps in his boxers. From the taste of his mouth, a smoker but not so addicted that he needs one as soon as he wakes up. Good morning, Justin, I say, checking out, checking out his, low vo his voice. Low. The voice in my head is always different. Justin doesn't take care of himself. His scalp itches. His eyes don't want to open. He hasn't gotten much sleep. Already I know I'm not going to like today. It's hard being in the body of someone you don't like, because you still have to respect it. I've harmed people's lives in the past, and I found that every time I slip up, it haunts me, so I try to be careful. From what I can tell, every person I inhabit, inhabit is the same age as me. I don't hop from being 16 to being 60. Right now, it's only 16. I don't know how this works, or why. I stopped trying to figure it out a long time ago. I'm never going to figure it out, any more than a normal person will figure out his or her own existence. After a while, you have to be at peace with the fact that you simply are. There is no way you know why. You can't have theories, but there will never you can have theories, but there will never be proof. I can access facts, not feelings. I know this is Justin's room, but I have no idea if he likes it or not. Does he want to kill his parents in the next room? Or would he be lost without his mother coming in to make sure he's awake? It's impossible to tell. It's as if the part of me replaces the same part of whatever, whatever person I'm in. And while I'm glad to be thinking like myself, a hint every now and then of how other person thinks would be helpful. We all contain mysterious, especially when seen from the inside. The alarm goes off. I reach for a shirt and some jeans. But something lets me see that it's the same shirt he wore yesterday. I pick a different shirt. I take the clothes with me to the bathroom, dress after showering. His parents are in the kitchen now. They have no idea that anything is different. Sixteen years is a lot of time to practice. I don't usually make mistakes. Not anymore. I read his parents easily. Justin doesn't talk to them much in the morning, so I don't have to talk to them. I have grown accustomed to sensing expectation in others, or the lack of it. I shovel down some cereal, leave the bowl in the sink without washing it, grab Justin keys and Justin's keys and go. Yesterday I was a girl in a town I'd guessed to be two hours away. The day before I was a boy in a town three hours farther than that. I'm already forgetting their details. I have to or else I will never remember who I really am. Justin listens to loud and obnoxious music on a loud an obnoxious station where loud and obnoxious DJs make loud and obnoxious jokes as a way of getting through the morning. This is all I need to know about Justin, really. I access his memory to show me the way to school, which parking space to take, which locker to go to, the combination, the names of the people he knows in the halls. Sometimes I, can, I can't go through these motions. I can't bring myself to go to school, maneuver through the day. I'll say I'm sick, stay in bed and read a few books. But even that gets tiresome after a while, and I find myself up for the challenge of a new school, new friends, for a day. 
As I take Justin's books out of his locker, I can feel someone hovering on the periphery. I turn and the girl standing there is transparent in her emotions. Tentative and expectant, nervous and adoring. I don't have to access Justin to know that this is his girlfriend. No one else would have this reaction to him, so unsteady to his in his presence. She's pretty, but she doesn't see it. She's hiding behind her hair, happy to see me and unhappy to see me at the same time. Her name is Ryanan, and for a moment, just the slightest beat, I think that, yes, this is the right name for her. I don't know why, I don't know her, but it feels right. This is not Justin's thought, it's mine. I try to ignore it. I'm not the person she wants to talk to. Hey, I say, keeping it casual. Hey, she murmurs back. She's looking at the floor at her inked in converse. She's strong cities there. Skylines run to souls. Some things happened between her and Justin, and I don't know what it is. It's probably not something that Justin even recognized at the time. Are you okay? I ask. I see the surprise on her face, even as she tries to cover it. This is not something that Justin normally asks. And then the strange thing is, I want to know the answer. The fact that she wouldn't care makes me want it more. Sure, she says, not so, not sounding sure at all. I find it hard to look at her. I know from experience that beneath every fer- peripheral girl is a central truth. She's hiding hers away, but at the same time she wants me to see it. That is, she wants Justin to see it. And it's there, just out of my reach. A sound waiting to be wor- to be a word. She's so lost in her sadness that she has no idea how visible it is. I think I understand her for a moment. I presume to understand her, but then, from within this sadness, she surprises me with a brief flash of determination, bravery even. Shifting her gaze away from the floor, her eyes matching mine, she asks, Are you mad at me? I can't think of any reason to be mad at her. If anything, I am mad at Justin for making her feel so diminished. It's there in her body language. When she's around him, she makes herself small. No, I say, I'm not mad at you at all. I tell her what she wants to hear, but she doesn't trust it. I feed her the right words, but she suspects they're threaded threaded with some with hooks. This is not my problem. I know that. I am here for one day. I cannot solve anyone's boyfriend problems. I should not change anyone's life. I turn away from her, get my books out, close the locker. Locker. She stays in the same spot, anchored by the profound, desperate loneliness of a bad relationship. Do you still want to get lunch today? She asks. The easy thing would be to say no. I often do this. Sense the other person's life drawing me in and run in the other direction. But there's something about her, the cities on her shoes, the flash of bravery, the unnecessary sadness, that makes me want to know what the word will be the word will be when it stops being a sound. I have spent years meeting people without ever knowing them, and on this morning, in this place, with this girl, I feel the faintest pull of wanting to know. And in a moment of either weakness or bravery on my own part, I decide to follow it. I decide to find out more. Absolutely, I say. Lunch would be great. Again, I read her. What I've said is too enthusiastic. Justice, Justin is never enthusiastic. No big deal, I add. She's relieved. Or at least as relieved as she'll allow herself to be. Which is a very guarded form of relief. By accessing, uh, By accessing, I know she and Justin have been together for over a year. That's as specific as it gets. Tristan doesn't remember the exact date. She reaches out and takes my hand. I'm surprised by how good this feels. I'm glad you're not mad at me, she says. I just want everything to be okay. I nod. If there's one thing I've learned, it's this. We all want everything to be okay. We don't even wish so much for fantastic or marvelous or outstanding. We will be... We will happily settle for okay, because most of the time, okay is enough. The first bell rings. I'll see you later, I say. Such a basic promise, but to Ryanan, it means the world. 
At first, it was hard to go through each day without making any last, lasting connections, leaving any life-changing effects. When I was younger, I craved friendship and closeness. I would make bonds without acknowledging how quickly and permanently they would break. I took other people's life. I took other people's lives personally. I felt their friends could be my my friends. Their parents could be my parents. But after a while, I had to stop. It was too heartbreaking to leave, to live with so many separations. I'm a drifter, and as lonely as that can be, it is also remarkably freeing. I will never define myself in terms of anyone else. I will never feel the pressure of peers of the burden or the burden of parental expectation. I can view everyone as pieces of a whole and focus on the whole, not the pieces. I've learned how to observe far better than most people observe. I'm not blinded by the past or motivated by the future. I focus on the present because that is where I'm destined to live. I learn. Sometimes I'm taught something I have already been taught in dozens of other classrooms. Sometimes I'm taught something completely new. I have to access the body, access the mind and see what information it's retained. And when I do, I learn. Knowledge is the only thing I take with me when I go. I know so many things that Justin doesn't know, that he will never know. I sit there in his math class, open his notebook and write down phrases he has never heard. Shakespeare and Kyriak, right, uh, and Dick Dickinson. Tomorrow or some day after tomorrow or never, he will see these words in his own handwriting and he won't have any idea where they came from or even what they are. That is, much inter- that is as much interference as I allow myself. Everything else must be done cleanly. Ryanan stays with me. Her details flickers from Justin's memories. Small things like the way her face her hair falls, the way she bites her fingernails, the determination and resignation in her voice, random things. I see her dancing with Justin's grandfather, because he said he wants to dance with a pretty girl. I see her covering her eyes during a scary movie, peering between her fingers, enjoying her fright. These are the good memories. I don't look at any others. I only see her once in the morning, a brief passing in the halls between first and second period. I find myself smiling when she comes near, and she smiles back. It's as simple as that, simple and complicated, as most true things are. I find myself looking for her after second period, and then again after third and fourth. I don't even feel in control of this. I want to see her, simple, complicated. By the time we get to lunch, I am exhausted. Justin's body is worn down from too little sleep, and I, inside of it, I'm worn down from restlessness and too much thought i wait for her at justin's locker first bell rings the second bell rings no ryanan maybe i was supposed to meet her somewhere else maybe justin's forgotten where they always meet if that's the case she's used to justin forgetting she finds me right when i'm about to give up the halls are nearly empty the kettle calls The kettle call has passed. She comes closer than she did before. Hey, I say. Hey, she says. She's looking to me. Justin is the one who makes the first move. Justin is the one who figures things out. Justin is the one who says what they are going to do. It depresses me. I've seen this too many times before. The unwarranted devotion. Putting up with the fear of being with the wrong person because he can't deal with the fear of being alone. The whole thing, thing to thing with doubt, the doubt thing with hope. Every time I see these feelings in someone else's face, it weighs me down. And there's something in Ryanan's face that's more than just the disappointments. There is a gentleness there, a gentleness that Justin will never ever appreciate. I see it right away, but nobody else does. I take all my books and put them in the locker. I walk over to her and put my hand lightly on her arm. I have no idea what I'm doing. I only know that I'm doing it. Let's go somewhere, I say. Where do you want to go? I'm close enough now to see that her eyes are blue. I'm close enough now to see that nobody ever gets close enough to see how blue her eyes are. I don't know, she replies. I take her hand. Come on, I tell her. This is no 
longer restlessness, it's recklessness. At first we're walking hand in hand, then we're running hand in hand. That chitty rush of keeping up with one another, of zooming through the school, reducing everything that's not us into an inconsequential blur. We're laughing, we are playful. We leave her books in her locker and move out of the building, into the air, the real air, the sunshine and the trees and the less burdensome world. I'm breaking the rules as I leave the school. I'm breaking the rules as we get into Justin's car. I'm breaking the rules as I turn the key in the ignition. Where do you want to go? I ask again. Tell me, truly, where you'd love to go? I don't initially realize how much highness on her answer. If she says, let's go to the mall, I will disconnect. If she says, take me back to your house, I will disconnect. If she says, actually, I don't want to miss six period, I will disconnect. And I should disconnect. I should not be doing this. But she says, I want to go to the ocean. I want you to take me to the ocean. And I feel connecting. And I feel myself connecting. It takes us an hour to get there. It's late September in Maryland. The leaves haven't begun to change, but you can tell they're starting to think about it. The greens are muted, faded, color is right around the corner. I give Ryanan control of the radio. She's, surpri she's surprised by this, but I don't care. I've had enough of the loud and, obno and the obnoxious, and I sense that she's had enough of it too. She brings melody to the car. A song comes on that, on that I know, and I sing along. And if I only, c and if I only could, I'd make a deal with God. Now Ryanan goes from surprised to suspicious. Justin never sings along. What's gotten into you? She asks. Music, I tell her. Huh? <laughs> no, really. She looks at me for a long time, then smiles. In that case, she says, flipping the dial to find the next song. Soon we're singing at the top of our lungs, a pop song that's uh, as substantial as a balloon, but lifts us in the same way when we sing it. It's as if time itself relaxes around us. She stops thinking about how unusual it is. She lets herself be part of it. I want to give her a good day. Just one good day. I have wandered for so long without any sense of purpose, and now this ephemeral purpose has been given to me. It feels like it has given to... It feels like it has been given to me. I only have a day to give, so why can't it be a good one? Why can't it be a shared one? Why can't I take the music of the moment and see how long it can last? The rules are erasable. I can take this. I can give this. When the song is over, she rolls down her window and trails her hand in the air, introducing a new music into the car. I roll down all the other windows and drive faster, so the wind takes over. Blows our hair all around, makes it seem like the car has disappeared and we are at the velocity we are the speed. Then another good song comes on and I enclose us again, this time taking her hand. I drive like that for miles and ask her questions, like how her parents are doing, what it's like now that her sister's off at college. If she thinks school is different at all this year, it's hard for her. Every single answer starts with the phrase, I don't know. But most of the time she does know, if I give her the time and the space in which to answer. Her mother means well, her father less so. Her sister isn't calling home, but Ryanan can understand that. School is school, she wants it to be over. But she's afraid of it being over, because then she'll have to figure out what comes next. She asks me what I think, and I tell her, honestly, I'm just trying to live day to day. It isn't enough, but it's something. We watch the trees, the sky, the signs, the road. We sense each other. The world right now it's on, is only us. We continue to sing along. And we sing, it, sing with the same abandon, not worrying too much if our voices hit the right, no, right notes or the right words. We look, at each we look at each other while we're singing. These aren't two solos. This is a duet that isn't taking itself at all seriously. It, I it is its own form of conversation. You can learn a lot about people from the stories they tell, but you can also know them from the way they sing along, whether they like the windows up or down, if they live by the map or by the world, if they feel the pull of the ocean. She tells me where to drive. 
off the highway, the empty back roads. This isn't summer, this isn't a weekend. It's the middle of a Monday and nobody but us is going to the beach. I should be in English class, Rannan says. I should be in bio, I say, accessing Justin's, accessing Justin's, Justin's schedule. We keep going. When I first saw her, she seemed to be balancing on edges and points. Now the ground is more even, welcoming. I know this is dangerous. Justin is not good to her. I recognize that. If I access the bad memories, I see tears, fights and remnants of passable togetherness. She is always there for him, and he must like that. His friends like her, and he must like that, too. But that's not the same as love. She has been hanging on to the hope of him for so long that she doesn't realize there isn't anything left to hope for. They don't have silences together. They have noise. Mostly his. If I tried, I could go deep into their arguments. I could track down whatever shots he's collected from all the times he's destroyed her. If I were really Justin, I would find something wrong with her. Right now. Tell her. Yell. Bring her down. Put her in her, sp put her in her place. But I can't. I'm not Justin. Even if she doesn't know it. Let's just enjoy ourselves, I say. Okay, she replies. I like that. I spend too much time thinking about running away. It's nice to actually do it. For a day. It's good to be on the other side of the window. I don't do this enough. There are so many things inside of her that I want to know. And at the same time, with every word we speak, I feel there may be something inside of her that I already know. When I get there, we will recognize each other. We will have that. I park the car and we head to the ocean. We take off our shoes and leave them under our seats. When we get to the sand, I lean over to roll up my jeans. While I do, Ryanan runs ahead. When I look back up, she's spinning around the beach, kicking up sand, calling my name. Everything at, the mo at that moment is lightness. She's so joyful, I can't help but stop for a second and watch. Witness, tell myself to remember. Come on, she cries. Get over here. I'm not who you think I am, I want to tell her, but there is no way. Of course there is no way. We have the beach to ourselves, the ocean to ourselves. I have her to myself. She has me to herself. There is a part of childhood that is childish, and a part that is scared, that is sacred. Suddenly we are touching the sacred part, running to the shoreline, feeling the first curl, curl Feeling the first cold burst of water on our ankles, reaching into the tide to catch to catch its shells before the, they ebb away from our fingers. We have returned to a world that is capable of glistening, and we are wetting deeper within it. We stretch our arms wide as if we are embracing the wind. She splashes, splashes me, misses mischievously and i mount a counterattack. our pants our shirts get wet but we don't care she asks me to help her build a sandcastle and as i do she tells me about how she and her sister would never work on sandcastles together if it was always a comp it was always a competition with her sister going for the highest possible mountains while ryanan paid attention to detail wanting each castle to be the dollhouse she has never allowed to have I see echoes of this detail now as she makes turrets bloom from her cupped hands. I myself have no memories of sandcastles, but there must be some sense memory some sense memory attached because I feel I know how to do this, how to shape this. When we are done, we walk back down to the water to wash off our hands. I look back and see the way our footsteps in intermingle to form a single path what is this she asks what is it she asks seeing my, me glance backward seeing something in my expression how can i explain this the only way i know to say the only way i know is to say thank you she looks at me as as if she's never heard the phrase before for what she asks for this i say for all of it this escape the water the waves her it feels like we've stepped outside of time, even though there is not such, is no such place. There's 
a part of her that's waiting for the twist. The moment will all of this when all of this pleasure will jackknife into pain. It's okay, I tell her. It's okay to be happy. The tears come to her eyes. I take her in my arms. It's the wrong thing to do, but it's the right thing to do. I have to listen to my own words. Happiness is so rarely a part of my vocabulary because for me it's so fleeting. I'm happy, she says. Really, I am. Justin would be laughing at her. Justin would be pushing her down into the sand to do whatever he wanted to do. Justin would never have come here. I'm tired of not feeling. I'm tired of not connecting. I want to be her here with her. I want to be the one who lives up to her hopes, if only for the time I'm given. The ocean makes its music. The wind does its dance. The whole we hold one on. At first we hold on to one another, but then it starts to feel like we are holding on to something even bigger than that. Greater. What's happening? Ryan and asks. Shh, I say. Don't question it. She kisses me. I have not kissed anyone in years. I have not allowed myself to kiss anyone for years. Her lips are soft as her lips are soft as flower petals, but with an intensity behind them. I take it slow, let each condensation of our contact linger in the heart of it heat of it. Oh, uh let each moment pour into the next, feel her skin, her breath. Taste the condensation of our contact, linger in the heat of it. Her eyes are closed and mine are open. I want to remember this is more than a single sensation. I want to remember this whole. We do nothing more than kiss. We do nothing less than kiss. At times she moves to take it further, but I don't need that. I trace her shoulders as she traces my back. I kiss her neck. She kisses beneath my ear. The times we stop, we smile at each other. Giddy disbelief. Giddy belief. She should be in English class. I should be in bio. We weren't supposed to come anywhere near the ocean today. We have defied the day as it was set out of, out for us. We walk hand in hand down the beach as the sun dips in the sky. I'm not thinking about the past. I'm not thinking about the future. I'm full of such gratitude for the sun, the water, the way my feet sink into the sand, the way my hand feels holding hers. We should do this every Monday, she says, and Tuesday, and Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday. We'd only get tired of it, I tell her. It's best to have it just once. Never again? She doesn't like the sound of that. Well, never say never. I'd say, I'd never say never, she tells me. There are a few more people on the beach now, mostly older men and women taking an afternoon walk. They nod to us as we pass, and tum- sometimes they say hello. And we we nod back, return the hellos, nobody questions why we're here, nobody questions anything, we're just a part of the moment, like everything else. The sun falls farther, the temperature drops alongside it, Ryanan shivers, so I stop holding her hand and put my arm around her. She suggests we go back to the car and get the make-out blanket from the trunk. We find we find it there, buried on the empty beer bottles, twisted jumper cap cables, and other guy crap. I wonder how often Ryanan and Justin have used the makeout blanket for that purpose, but I don't try to access access the memories. Instead, I bring the blanket back out onto the beach and put it down for both of us. I lay down and face the sky, and Ryanan lays down next to me and does the same. We stare at the clouds, breathing distance from one another, talking it all in, taking it all in. This has to be one of the best days ever, Ryanan says. Without turning my head, I find her hand with my hand. Tell me about some of the other days like this, I ask. I don't know. Just one, the first one that comes to mind. Rannan thinks about it for a second, then she s- shakes her head. It's stupid. Tell me. She turns to me and moves her hand to my chest, makes lazy circles there. For some reason, the first thing that comes to my mind is this mother-daughter fashion show. Do you promise you won't laugh? I promise. She studies me, makes sure I'm sincere, continues. It was in fourth grade or something. 
Renwick's was got was doing a fundraiser for hurricane victims, and they asked for volunteers from our class. I didn't did not I didn't ask my mother or anything. I just signed up, and when I brought the information home, well, you know how my mom is. She was terrified. It's hard enough to get her out of, to the supermarket, but a fashion show in front of the stranger in front of strangers. I might as well have asked her to pose for Playboy. Playboy, God! Now there's a scary that there's a scary thought. Thought her hand is now resting on my chest. She's looking off to the sky, but there's the thing. But here's the thing. She didn't say no. I guess it's only now that I realize what I put her through. She didn't make me go to the teacher and take it back. No, when the day came. We drove over to Renwick's and went there. Went where they told us to go. I had thought in, they would put us in matching outfits, but it wasn't like that. Instead, they basically told us we could wear whatever we wanted from the store. So there we were, trying all these things on. I went for the gowns, of course. I was such more of a girl then. I ended up with this light blue dress, ruffles all over the place. I thought it was so sophisticated. I'm sure it was classy. I say. She hits me. Shut up. Let me tell this. Let me tell my story. I hold her hand on my chest, lean over, and kiss her quickly. Go ahead. I say. I'm loving this. I never have people tell me their stories. I usually have to figure them out myself, because I know that if people tell me stories, they will expect them to be remembered, and I cannot guarantee that. There is no way to know if the stories stay after I'm gone, and how devastating would it be to confide in someone and have to con? And how devastating would it be to confide in someone and have the confidence disappear? I don't want to be responsible for that, but with Rannan, I can't resist. She continues. So I had my wannabe prom dress, and then it was Mom's turn. She surprised me because she went for the dresses too. I'd never really seen her all dressed up before, and I think that was the most amazing thing to me. It wasn't me who was Cinderella; it was her. After we picked out our clothes, they put makeup on us and everything. I thought Mom was going to flip, but she was actually enjoying it. They didn't really do much with her; just a little more color. And that was all it took. She was pretty. I know it's hard to believe, knowing her now, but that day she was like a movie star. All the other moms were complimenting her, and when it was time for the actual show, we paraded out there and people applauded. Mom and I were both smiling, and it was real, you know. We didn't get to keep the dresses or anything, but I remembered, on the ride home, Mom kept saying how great I was when we. Got back to our house. Dad looked at us like we were aliens. But the cool thing is, he t- decided to play along. Instead of getting all weird, he kept calling us his supermodels and asked us to do the show for him in our living room, which we did. We were laughing so much, and that was it. The day ended. I'm not sure. Mom's worn makeup since, and it's not like I turned out it, like I turned out to be a supermodel. But that day reminds me of this one because it was a break from everything, wasn't it? It sounds like it. It sounds like it. I tell her. I can't believe I just told you that. Why? Because, I don't know. I. It just sounds so silly. No, it sounds like a good day. How about you? She asks. I was never in a mother-daughter fashion show. I choke. Even though, as a matter of fact, I've been in a few. She hits me loudly on the shoulder. No, tell me about another day like this one. I ask his chest in and find out he moved to town when he was twelve. So anything before that is fair game because Ryanen won't have been there. I could try to find one of Chestin's memories、uh, to share, but I don't want to do that. I want to give Ryanen something of my own. There was this one day when I was eleven. I try to remember the name of the boy whose body I was in. But it's lost to me. I was playing hide and seek with my friends. I mean, the brutal tackle kind of hide and seek. We were in the woods, and for some reason, I decided that 
What I had to do was to climb a tree. I don't think I'd ever climbed a tree before, but I found one with some low branches and just started moving. Up and up. Uh, it was na- It was as natural as walking. In my memory, that tree was hundreds of feet tall. Thousands. At some point, I crossed the, li- the tree line. I was still climbing, but there weren't any other trees around. I was all by myself, clinging to the trunk of this tree, a long way from the ground. I can see shimmers of it now, the height, the, the, the town below me. It was magical, I say. There's no other word to describe it. I could hear my friends yelling as they were caught, as the game played out, but I was in a completely different place. I was seeing the world from above, which is an, is an extraordinary thing when it happens for the first time. I'd never flown in a plane. I'm not even sure I'd been in a tall building. So there was, so there I was, hovering above everything I knew. I had made, I had made it somewhere special, and I'd gone there all on my own. Nobody had given it to me. Nobody had to- had told me to do it. I'd climbed and climbed and climbed, and this was my reward: to watch over the world and to be alone with myself. That I found was what I needed. Uh, Rhiannon leans into me. That's amazing, she whispered. She whispers, yeah, it was. And it was in Minnesota? In truth, it was in North Car- Carolina. But I asked Justin to find and find that, yes, for him it would have been Minnesota, so why not? You want to know another day like this one? Rhiannon asks, curling closer. I adjust my arm, make us both comfortable. Sure, our second date, but this is only our first, but this is only our first, I think, ridiculously, ridiculously, really, I ask, remember? I check to see if Tristan remembers their second date, he doesn't, thanks party, she prompts, still nothing, yeah, I hedge, I don't know, maybe it doesn't count as a date, but it was the second time we hooked up, and I don't know, You were just so sweet about it. Don't get mad, all right? I wonder where this is going. I promise, nothing could make me mad right now, I tell her. Even cross my heart to prove it. She smiles. Okay, well, lately, it's like you're always in a rush. Like, we have sex, but we're not really intimate. And I don't know... I don't mind. I mean, it's fun, but every now and then, it's good to have it be like this. And the Dex party, it was like this. Like you had all the time in the world, and you wanted us to have it together. I love that. It was back when you were really looking at me. Uh, It was like, well, it was like you'd climbed up that tree and found me there at the top. And we had that together, even though we were in someone's backyard. At one point... To remember, you made me move over a little so it'd be in the moonlight. It makes you, it makes your skin glow, you said. And I felt like that, glowing. Because you were watching me, along with the moon. Does she realize that right now she's lit by the warm orange spreading from the horizon as not quite day becomes not quite night? I lean over and become that shadow. I kiss her once, we Then we drift into each other, close our eyes, drift into sleep. And as we drift into sleep, I feel something I've never felt before. A closeness that isn't merely physical. A connection that defies the fact that we've only just met. A sensation that can only come from the most euphoric... Euphoric? Euphoric? No! I... euphoric euphoric of feelings belonging what is it that what is what is it about the moment you fall in love how can such a small measure of time contain such enormity i suddenly realize why people believe in deja vu why people believe in they've lived past lives because there is no way the years i've spent on this earth could possibly encapsulate what i'm feeling The moment you fall in love feels like it has centuries behind it, generations, all of them rearranging themselves so that it's so that this 
precious, remarkable intersection could happen in your heart, in your bones, no matter how silly you know it is. You feel that everything has been leading to this. All the secret errors were pointing here. The universe and time itself crafted this long ago. And you are just now realizing it. You are just now arriving at the place you were always meant to be. We wake an hour later to the sound of her phone. I keep my eyes closed. Her Hear the, gr the groan. Hear her tell her mother she'll be home soon. The water has gone deep black and the sky has gone ink blue. The chill in the air presses harder against us as we pick up the blanket, provide a new set of footprints. She navigates, I drive. She talks, I listen. We sing some more. Then she leans into my shoulder and I let her stay there and sleep for a little longer, dream for a little longer. I'm trying not to think of all what will happen next. I'm trying not to think of endings. I never get to see people while they're asleep. Not like this. She is the opposite of when I first met her. Her vulnerability is open, she, but she's safe within it. I watch the rise of and fall of her, the stir and rest of her. I only wake her when I need to, her to tell me where to go. The last ten minutes she talks about what we're going to do tomorrow. I find it hard to respond. Even if we can't do this, I'll see you at lunch, she asks. Even if we can't do this, I'll see you at lunch, she asks. I nod. And maybe we can do something after school. I think so. I mean, I'm not sure what else is going on. My mind isn't really there right now. This makes sense to her. Fair enough. Tomorrow is tomorrow. Let's end today on a nice note. Once we get to town, I can access the directions to her house within having to ask her. But I want to get lost anyway, to prolong this, to escape this. Here we are, Ryanan says as we approach her driveway. I pull the car to a stop. I unlock the doors. She leans over and kisses me. My senses are alive with the taste of her, the smell of her, the feel of her, the sound of her breathing, the sight of her as she pulls her body away from mine. That's the nice note, she says. And before I can say anything else... She's out the door and gone. I don't get a chance to say goodbye. I guess correctly that Justin's parents are used to him being out of touch and missing dinner. They try to yell at him, but you can't tell that everyone's going through the emotions and when Justin storms off to his room, it's just the la latest re rerun of an old show. I should be doing Justin's homework. I'm always pretty con conscientious. About that kind of thing. If I'm able to do it. But my mind keeps drifting to Ryan. And imagining her at home. Imagining her floating from the grace of the day. Imagining her believing that things are different. That Justin has somehow changed. I shouldn't have done it. I know I shouldn't have done it. Even if it felt like the universe was telling me to do it. I agonize over it for hours. I can't take it back. I can't make it go away. I fell in love once, or at least until the day I thought I had. His name was Brennan, and it felt so real, even if it was mostly words, intense, heartful words. I stupidly let myself think of a possible future with him, but there was no future. I tried to navigate it, but I couldn't. There was, That was easy compared to this. It's one thing to fall in love. It's another to feel something else falling in love with you and to feel a responsibility toward that love. There is no way for me to stay in this body. If I don't go to sleep, the shift will happen anyway. I used to think that if I stayed up all night, I'd get to remain where I was, but instead I was ripped from the body I was in, and the ripping felt exactly like what you would imagine being ripped from a body would feel like, with every single nerve experiencing the pain of the break, and then the pain of being fused into someone new. From the one I went to sleep every night. From then on I went to sleep every night. There was no use fighting it. I realize I have to call her. Her number's right there in his phone. I can't let her think tomorrow is going to be like today. Hey, she answers. Hey, I say. Thank you again for today. Yeah. I don't want to do this. I don't want to ruin it. But I have to. Don't I? I continue. But about today, 
Are you going to tell me that we can't cut class every day? That's not like you, not like me. Yeah, I say, but you know, I don't want you to think every day is going to be like today, because they're not going to be alright. They can't be. There's a silence. She knows something's wrong. I know that, she says carefully. But maybe things can still be better. I know they can be. I don't know, I tell her. That's all I wanted to say. I don't know. Today was something, but it's not like everything. I know that. Okay. Okay. I sigh. There's always a chance that... Chains that... Chance? Chains? Chance? <laughs> that his life will in fact change. Change. That he will change. But I have no way of knowing. It's rare that I get to see a body after I've left it. And even then, it's usually months or years later, if I recognize it at all. I want Justin to be better to her, but I can't have her expecting it. That's all, I tell her. It feels like a Justin thing to say. Well, I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, you you will. Thanks again for today. No matter what trouble we get into tomorrow for it, it was worth it. Yeah, I love you, she says. And I want to say it. I want to say, I love you too. Right now, right at this moment, every part of me would mean it, but that but that will only last for a couple more hours. Sleep well, I tell her, then I hang up. There's a notebook on his desk. Remember that you love Ryan and I write in his handwriting. I doubt he'll remember writing it. I go onto his computer. I open up my own email account, then type out her name, her phone number, her email address, as well as Justin's email address and password i write about the day and uh, write about the day and send it to myself as soon as i'm through i clear Tristan's history this is hard for me i've gotten so used to what i am and how my life works i never want to stay i'm always ready to leave but not tonight tonight i'm haunted by the fact that tomorrow he'll be here and won't be and i won't be i want to stay i pray to stay i close my eyes and wish to stay